So this, um, this idea of how uh, these kinds of prescriptive representations operate in this kind of dual way um, is absolutely central to thinking about the generative effects um, of, of, of these kinds of technologies. Um, and the idea that centers of coordination are, are reflexively constituted as centers through their socio-technical labors, um, that they're engaged not just in the kind of recognition of what's going on out there, but rather in actually generating the fields of activity um, to which they're accountable, for which they're accountable, uh, has now been elaborated um, through, through a range of studies. Um, and as just one further example, I could cite uh, Karen Norsetina uh, and Urs Brueger on what they name um, apresentation uh, in the case of, of financial markets. Um, so I'll take this quote about, uh, as they say, bringing the territorial distant, territorially distant and invisible near to participants, rendering it interactionally or response present as a kind of transition here. So their, their idea is that these these um, networks of information and communications technologies effectively create a market um, as a kind of space that traders can inhabit um, and in which their actions subsequently have effects. And if, as we've learned, uh, financial markets became a somewhat um, self-generating, self-referential kind of, 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 of habitat. Uh, for financial traders in ways that turned out to be quite disastrous for those of us for whom you know money actually still um, uh, had to have some more more tangible um, form. So I'll take this quote um, here as a kind of transition to move me from financial traders uh, and and this idea of centers of coordination um, to questions of of socio-technical agency and distance and proximity, uh, and my own current focus on uh, military technologies. Um, so questions of, of apresentation in contemporary technology-intensive war fighting uh, include the progressive elaboration of technologies that are configured to enable action at a distance, and more specifically uh, through forms, various forms of remote control. Um, and these develops are led uh, by my country of citizenship, the United States, um, far out ahead in terms of its, um, its investments in military technologies. But I might note that this console is made by Kinetic, uh, which is a leading producer based here in the UK. So the Britain is not far behind, and we could have an interesting discussion about Germany's uh, very contested relationship to all of this. Um, so here's an image um, of a remote control interface. This is taken from an article in the New York Times in November of 2010 uh, that was titled War Machines Recruiting Robots for Combat. So um, this is part of my ongoing interest um, in robotics. So War Machines Recruiting Robots for Combat. Um, but I was most struck, what really provoked me about this image is the caption that goes along with it, uh, and particularly its closing phrase. So, um, I'll read it to you because it's very small. It reads, remotely controlled, some armed robots are operated with video game style consoles helping to keep humans away from danger. <laughs> so it's the implied universality, and, and this, this rhetoric is very recurring when in, in talking about defense um, robotics and automation. It's about keeping keeping humans away from danger. So it, it's, of course, the, uh, the implied universality of the category human and, and the self-evidence of, of the danger that we must be protected from um, on the one hand. And then, of course, the associated dehumanization or erasure of those who would be the targets of this device um, that was one of the provocations um, for, for the project that I'm involved in now. Um, this, this is a quintessential uh, articulation of us and them, basically, and, and that's kind of the, the, the central problematic. So then, of course, we have drones. Um, and the US media, at least, are, are really fascinated with the geographical distance um, between the pilots of remotely operated drones, who are you know, 
is famously sitting in trailers in Air Force bases in the Nevada desert, and the targets of their actions, which are you know 7,000 or so miles away um, in Afghanistan, Pakistan. Um, and all sorts of interesting questions about distance and proximity. Um, you can see here the, t the headline on this, on this uh, news article is drone pilots have a front row seat um, from half a world away. Um, so there's this fascination uh, with this idea of the sort of folding of, of space. Um, but uh, this, these questions of distance and, and proximity are, are fascinating, but they're also now beginning to be questioned by scholars who are looking at these, uh, these configurations. Um, they're starting to be questioned more deeply, and I think in very interesting ways. So the drone pilot may be in a front row seat, um, as, and this is, of course, a reference to the video feed that the drone pilot is um, engaged with. But critical scholars like geographer Derek Gregory are starting to elaborate what Gregory characterizes as the narrowness of vision afforded by, by the predator. So he writes, my starting point, um, and that's in, this, in the critique that he's, that he's developing, is the illusion that the use of the intelligence, surveillance, and reconnaissance capabilities of remote platforms like the MQ-1 Predator or the MQ-9 Reaper produces a transparent battle space, um, very relevant to our interest in situational awareness. A, a transparent ba battle space, in effect, a version of Donna Haraway's God trick, the ability to see everything from nowhere in particular. And Gregory reminds us that even bodies that are directly immersed in combat can be understood as systematically encapsulated within very specific and arguably very parochial geographies. And I'll say more about that in a moment. Um, so in, in a post on uh, his really quite extraordinary blog, Geographical Imaginations, which I really recommend if you're interested in these things. Uh, so this is a post titled, The God Trick and the Administration of Military Violence. Um, he writes, Advocates have made much of the extraordinary ability of the full motion video feeds from predators and reapers to provide persistent surveillance, the all-seeing eye, so that they become vectors of the phantasmatic desire to produce a fully transparent battle space. Critics, myself included, have insisted that vision is more than a biological instrumental capacity however, and that it is transformed into a conditional and highly selective visuality through the activation of a distinctively political and cultural technology. Seen thus, these feeds interpolate their distant viewers to create an intimacy with ground troops while ensuring that the, others, that the action of others within the field of view remain obdurately other. So he's setting up this very interesting argument about the kind of vectors of connection between uh, the drone pilots and the others like them, our, our guys on the ground, as being the real sort of um, nexus of, of, of connection and the systematic othering of the other actors um, in the field of view. And Gregory argues um, that the possibility of you know, what Donna Haraway has famously characterized as the God trick, this, uh, this, this dream of a kind of completely transparent battlefield, is also um, compromised by the networks within which um, these remote platforms are deployed. Uh, so he points out that, that designs that are aimed at compensating for the narrowness of the predator video feed, which has been described by as sort of looking through a soda straw. So you've got a very close up view of a very narrow kind of field of vision. So there are designs that try to compensate for, for this like um, window based mapping tools like Falcon View, Falcon View that's um, pictured here, um, again from his blog. Um, and this shows the predator view as the small square that's kind of overlaid on this wider landscape. But he argues that it's actually attempting to align all of these different views that actually contributes to what, um, since um, Karl von Clausewitz has famously been characterized as the fog of war. So the, this proliferation of networked information and communications technologies then, of course, set up requirements for bringing them all together, for continually cross-referencing them, aligning them, and that that itself, in the sort of forensic analyses of the 
cases that have now been documented of, of misrecognition of, of the, the, the killing of, of people who are obviously civilians is in part actually an effect of trying to juggle all of these different views, all of these different pieces of what should be the perfect, um, the perfect uh, God's eye view. And he, uh, Gre Derek Gregory, has been working on an account of what he calls the dispersed and distributed field of militarized vision, drawing on thousands of pages of post-action reports um, by the US Defense Department, uh, which you can get through Freedom of Information Act um, uh, uh, actions in, in the United States. So these thousands of pages of reports that are reports on specific these specific incidents of erroneous targeting of civilians in Afghanistan and Pakistan. So trying to do a kind of forensic reconstruction of the networked communications um, in these incidents. Um, so in the airstrikes that he analyzes, um, those who are involved in these network operations not only are engaging with all of these various visual um, fields, uh, but of course they're also busy communicating uh, through radios and also through the type messages um, that are displayed in military internet relay chat systems um, or what are called tactical chat windows. Um, he, and he, uh, Gregory on his blog, offers an indication. This is an image from the US military's uh, multi-service manual on tactical chat. So this is a kind of instruction manual um, on the use of, of tactical chat and you can find all the the um, links um, on the blog. So he concludes, it is, it's necessary to consider the multiple viewing positions involved in network military violence. There is a decentralized, distributed, and dispersed geography of militari militarized vision whose fields of view expand, contract, and even close at different locations. And so it's in actually looking at how out of this incredibly complex network of communications, um, the misidentification uh, actually occurs, um, that the analysis begins to, to make clear uh, that, that what, what was hoped to be the solution to the problem of the fog of war is in fact reconstituting that fog, is sort of rematerializing it um, in new media. Uh, so that these networked um, ICTs are, are actually um, part of what's not only a visual field, but also a field of communications of multiple bodies, um, human and non-human, on the move in real time, um, all of which are attempting to be deciphered. Now, this, these analyses stand in rather stark contrast to the military's aspirations for what the military calls situational awareness. This is a, uh, a military term, long-standing priority problem for the military themselves. So here is one statement, uh, aspirational statement, by uh, Major Brad C. Dostal, who is um, part of the US Army's Center for Army Lessons Learned. Um, and he's defining what's required in this article, which is entitled, Enhancing Situational Understanding Through the Employment of Unmanned Aerial Vehicles. So this is the idea that UAVs are going to contribute to this kind of transparent battle space. And so he writes, situational understanding is, quote, the ability to maintain a constant, clear mental picture of relevant information and the tactical situation, including friendly and threat situations. The reconnaissance, surveillance, and target acquisition elements must provide situational understanding of the operational environment in all of its dimensions, political, cultural, economic, demographic, as well as military factors. So.